Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Dataversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing building and growing organizational analytics with data lakes. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag ADVAnalytics. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat feature in the bottom middle of your screen. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William is the president of McKnight Consulting Group. He takes corporate information and turns it into a bottom line producing asset. He's worked with major companies worldwide, 15 of the Global 2000, and many others. McKnight Consulting Group focuses on delivering business value and solving business problems, utilizing proven, streamlined approaches and in information management. His teams have won several best practice competitions for their implementations. He has been helping companies adopt big data solutions. And with that, I will give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Hello, and indeed, here we go, Shannon. Uh, thank you and welcome, everybody. This is one of my favorite hours of the month, especially uh, during this pandemic time, I look forward to sharing with you every month. I know you're out there, even though I can't see you. Uh, this is a very hot topic, uh, at least for me, I would suspect for uh, many in this industry right now. And it's about data lakes and what are they and what are they good for and do I need one of these things and, and how do I build one? I just have been fielding a lot of calls on this topic and I want to uh, kind of bring together a lot of the uh, conversation that I've been having about this, try to clear some things up because there's a lot of uh, lack of clarity about this out there. I mean, you don't want to build a, a lake for the sake of it. Um, you definitely don't want to build a lake that turns into a swamp kind of thing, uh, which is unused. And um, a lot of people are wondering, well, is this just more vendor hype and consultant hype to, to guilt me into doing a project that I don't really need? And uh, what is it really? Is it the function uh, that uh, the lake provides, meaning that it can be on a variety of platforms, or is it really the platform that it's on? Is it cloud storage or HDFS or some combination of that? So most people use it as uh, defining the platform, and uh, I will as well. But I do caution that we use the term, uh, I don't want to say appropriately, like as if I have the definition of it, but I'd say consistently. So. If you're lacking that consistent definition, uh, hopefully I'll give you something here today to kind of forge within your organization. And one thing, one thing that will come out is that I am advocating that most organizations, most enterprises that are mid-sized and up need at least one of these. And uh, hopefully I'll share with you why as we go along here and some of the nice use cases uh, that uh, others are enjoying uh, with the data lake. So, a little bit about me uh, here. I've been introduced, uh, do a lot of this kind of talking and uh, um, primarily consulting uh, to you all, uh, as well as doing quite a bit of analyst work lately. Yes, strategy, known for our strategy, a lot of training and uh, workshops, things like that to uh, help you over an issue you might be having. And we do implementation in all of these areas. Okay, let's start with analytic data stores because after all, the data lake is an analytic data store. Now, I realize that um, sometimes it's operational. Um, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm going to go with the primary definition here of something that's post-operational that receives data, kind of like a data warehouse, if you're familiar with that. So, uh, a data warehouse will receive data from the operational environment and uh, distribute that data into the analytical environment and obviously make it available for use. The data lake does something very similar. I'm also talking about the data lake, um, similarly to a data warehouse in that it has multiple uses. It's not just data for an individual application in your enterprise, although that's a great way to get started. And frankly, if that's where you are, that's where many are with this, is they found something that has a need for all that data. Um, that's okay, and I'd say the vast majority of this talk is for you, but I do want you to aspire to kind of like our data warehouse, make it available for multiple purposes uh, within your organization. So, without further ado, um, here are some of the right-fitting, as I say, 
analytic platform. So if you have platforms out there that fall outside of this little cluster of uh, terms, um, these are well-worn terms in the industry and well-worn ideas and great artifacts for your architect architecture. So if you have other things, uh, I'd encourage you to try to make them into something that is one of these things. The enterprise data warehouse, yeah, we all know about that, right? Uh, a dependent data model is something that's fed from uh, the data warehouse. Uh, I, I also have on here an independent data model. Yeah, I'm using some old terms, but I like them and they fit. Uh, an independent data model is not fed from the data warehouse, but it's fed from the operational system. It's not for multiple purposes. And yes, yes, people, there are real good reasons to have independent data marts. Um, some of our data warehouses are, are locked into what they do for us as an organization. They're not gonna, they're gonna, not gonna move uh, with uh, agility. They're kind of like a big old freighter ship in, in the harbor that has to take a little time to turn around, right? So if you need something electric uh, with electricity, alacrity, okay, let me get it right. And electricity uh, for that matter. But um, anyway, if you need something like that, um, yeah, you might uh, consider an independent data mark, but keep it architected as you do that. And then the enterprise data lake, which is what we're here to talk about. And what we're kind of also here to talk about is a nice big data cluster on cloud storage that is useful for a given application. And that might be the beginnings of a data lake, or it might be something that is meant forever for that singular purpose. And you also have a data lake. Okay, so there's uh, there's so many combinations of this. I know it's just five bullets, but there's so many combinations of this out there. Um, you're not necessarily wrong with whatever you're doing now. There are reasons why you are where you are in terms of your architecture, in terms of your technology selection. The only thing to do really is focus on the future and focus on moving forward and inching the thing forward towards something that is going to provide more opportunity for the business as you go forward. And so that's why I say things like, well, try to try to make all those things into one of these five things as, as we go forward. So we're in the definition phase of the presentation here for sure, but this is really important because this is where many enterprises trip up. They have multiple of these definitions running around uh, and uh, it just makes things a little bit slower. And um, I always, uh, it, when I, whenever I'm talking to a vendor, taking in a briefing or what have you, I'm always making sure we're on the same page in terms of what we mean to be a data lake. It's just thrown around so much that got to be careful. Anyway, this is the cloud, of course. Okay, cloud storage. Uh, there's a lot of people. Uh, so I'm trying to show here a lot of people on the data lakes, not just a singular application. Now, this is a relational database um, page structure for a data page, the pr predominant you know, shape of pages out there. Um, this is not in my uh, ultimate data lake. This is not a data lake. I'm going to strike through this in a minute. But I mean, this is basically what Snowflake is, right? It's, and I'm going to put, put another word up here. Okay, so Snowflake is a relationally formed storage uh, where SQL works with it. It's on S3. It's on cloud storage. Is it a data lake? Um, I'd say by my definition, no, it's not a data lake because it's formatted relational. But, you know, label it what you wish. Um, even I've, I've even heard Snowflake kind of refer to it as a data lake, uh, sort of opportunistically. So watch out and be careful and all that. But uh, I am talking about structure that is not completely SQL based. There might be SQL like access to it. Uh, everything SQL like access. We tried to. Uh, a little soapbox here, but uh, SQL is, is so so strong that we can't we can't fork off of it really hard. <laughs> so here we are. We're still using forms of SQL, if not SQL itself. Uh, and back to my slide, the data lake is not formatted relationally. It's formatted more in a in a row, uh, if you will, and delimiter and row delimiter and and yeah, there's some loose. Uh, some loose pointers over the top that tell you where things are, like in the old H catalog and stuff like that. So there are ways to find your way around in cloud storage. Um, and I, I specifically did not say Hadoop in here, not, now did I? And many of your data lakes are on Hadoop, and that's fine. Uh, I'm talking about going forward, though, I think many fewer, uh, if that's a term, will be uh, less 
on HDFS and Hadoop and more and more and more in cloud storage. But that doesn't mean you're you're rushing to the refrigerator to uh, get rid of your HDFS data lakes that are maybe serving a, a good purpose. But I do see a lot of companies that are starting to create a, a parallel strategy to that with cloud storage. Also, also, when I say enterprise, uh, don't be alienated because you're working in one part of the enterprise and yet you're doing this stuff because in, especially in big enterprises, it's just too much of a ball of wax to uh, get your arms around the entire enterprise. Everything that rolls up to the CEO, it must be at that level to be an enterprise data lake and to do it right and all that. No, 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 not necessarily at all. Now, you want it as big as possible, but that as possible is uh, very fungible here because I don't want you to, I don't just stop within your, say, small department and say, well, you know, that's all I can see, so I'm going to make a data lake here. I mean, reach around, reach out, branch out, but there does become limits to one's capability. I'd say if you're not going to be able to start and finish uh, something of value to the business with a data lake approach in the next, say, six months, then you're thinking too big. And this is where a lot of companies just stall out because, well, it's not, it's not big enough. It's not at the enterprise level. So uh, let's just, we can't, I guess we can't do that. And I've, I heard the same thing, the same thing multiple times in the world of data warehousing. Yes, we can't do that. We'll just build data mark. Um, well, uh, no, you can build the enterprise concept in a smaller part of the organization. So over here under this vice president, maybe is good enough and maybe this organization will have two or three. It's, it's kind of an approach to things. The enterprise is kind of an approach to things. Now, I, I mentioned HDFS, Hadoop, right? Hadoop versus cloud storage and why, why is there some pull away from uh, HDFS and, and toward cloud storage? Cloud storage is going to be cheaper uh, and that's obviously a big selling point. Um, it doesn't have as much formatting on as uh, HDFS. H HDFS has, has a little bit more. It gives it, I would say, straight up better query performance, um, although straight up is, is um, kind of fungible. But generally speaking, um, I've had better luck out of the box with HDFS for query performance. But all these other things, uh, I haven't. And I think we've learned that, especially in these early days, um, that we, we don't have a huge army of people necessarily that's that's on this. I know I said earlier it's an enterprise data lake. You got multiple people, multiple applications. It's true, but it's not the the armies of people that the data warehouse is is supporting. Not today, and probably not for the foreseeable future. So uh, I'm not saying performance isn't important. It's very important, but other things are important as well around the manageability concept of it and the cost concept of it, and so on. So. Uh, and, and by the way, there's many things you can do with cloud storage to speed up performance, and we're learning what they are, and the vendors are definitely supporting cloud storage more and more, and we're seeing it perform much faster, uh, exponentially faster over the course of the past few uh, years of benchmarks we've been doing. So cloud storage, yeah, let's use cloud storage for our data lakes going forward. Got, got a lot of things going forward, including more achievable separation of compute and storage. Compute resources can be taken down, scaled up, or out, or interchanged without data movement uh, to a higher degree, I would say, than with HDFS. And what else do I want to point out here? Um, yeah, most of the query execution is processed from time, not data transport. So if cloud compute and storage are in the same cloud vendor region, performance is hardly impacted. It's just one of those, one of those tips, if you will, uh, that we've learned uh, makes for a great cloud storage uh, environment. So. In quick summary here at this point, we have data lakes, good for the enterprise, uh, not necessarily for the entire enterprise. Uh, they are on cloud storage. They're not using SQL straight up, and uh, they're not in relational format. So stuff like S3 and uh, Google Data Proc and stuff like that, we're going to get to some, some names here as we go along. Data lakes, cloud storage versus data warehouse. Okay, this is the other side of the coin. I just juxtaposed the cloud storage with HDFS, and now I'm going to talk about cloud storage versus relational data warehouses. Now, before I launch into this, let me just say data warehouses have no end in sight. Um, please, uh, I, get, I get calls, is it dead? Uh, you know, should we do everything in the lake? 
Uh, and usually anybody saying that, when they describe what they mean by data lake, they're essentially describing the data warehouse. And the data, the RDBMS is going to be better technology, a better technology foundation, along with the ecosystem for supporting the things that that person is saying. So again, it gets back to terminology. So much right now does. But data lakes versus the data warehouse, some of the distinguishing points here. And you might need these as you're determining which of these analytic platforms to put your data into. And sometimes you select both of them. As a matter of fact, I'm going to suggest that data lakes actually collect all the data and uh, uh, move it on to the data warehouse from there. So be your staging area. But that's not really what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about actual access to the data. Where are you going to access the data? And do you even need to move it on to the data warehouse or not? Okay, so in the data lake, usually no pre-specified data model, although if one comes with the data, I'm not inclined to blow it away. A data lake is great for history data. And by the way, a little side soapbox here, another one, um, history data. Where are you keeping your history data? And there should not be three, four, five answers uh, to that. Should be a clear answer uh, for the enterprise. Um, and I don't mean just one, one place. I just mean a clear answer. Maybe you're collecting your POS history data in the lake and you're collecting your customer history data in the warehouse. Um, that's okay, as long as that's what you're really doing. But it should, it should be clear. This is one of the you know, 30 questions that you want to ask yourself to, to make sure you're doing your job right as a data warehouse manager, as a data lake manager, as a data manager, an analytic data manager of the organization. Where is history data being kept? And hopefully the answer is it's being kept for a long, long time. You're not blowing that away and it's kept in an accessible place. Um, tape drives are not a great answer anymore. Uh, so let me move on from the second bullet. Um, a data lake easily accepts all data types, all data types. Now the data warehouse is pretty good. The, the RDBMS is now pretty good at accepting a lot of data types. As a matter of fact, that's taking a lot of the things, uh, keeping a lot of the things on the data warehouse that used to be uh, destined for the data lake because the RDBMSs have done such a great job in the past few years of adding to its capabilities that it hasn't been sitting around while the lakes have moved, uh, you know, moved into its, uh, into its territory, if you will. So I see growth, I see massive growth really for both of these structures in organizations. And in the actionable future, <clears throat> as I say, that's the future that you actually plan for. Yes, one day we won't need any of this. We're not planning for that day. All right, we're planning for the next five years, five to 10 years maybe. And so in that planning phase, we are planning in data warehouses for sure. We're planning in data lakes for sure. Now on the data lake, I mentioned fewer users, more, more exploration and discovery. You have a higher, um, scientific level, I'll put it that way, of user base for data in the data lake. But again, you know what? I'm really okay if you think, if you can think this through down at the technical level about what these various platforms provide to you and you make your decisions about what those where, when and how based on that. I mean, that's really what you should do. But if you can't, you can make it at a, a more shallow level and you'll still be okay. But it is important that organizations have a direction as to when the warehouse is going to be used and when which warehouse is going to be used, if that's a question, and when data lakes are to be used. And um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's, you know, it's obvious it's how people are using it. You don't want to lock it in, but a lot of users out there, even the scientific ones, they need some direction. More exploration and discovery, okay. Lighter data governance, I'll define that as we go. Limitless big data. So I would say, you know, if it's really big data uh, and, you know, interpret that for yourself, uh, that needs to go into the uh, data lake. Uh, I have also found, and I'm sure you have as well, if you think about it, that the bigger the data, the smaller the audience for that data. So that kind of plays into this juxtaposition of lakes and warehouses. Now, let's talk about the balance of analytics going forward. Right now, the balance of analytics looks like, looks like this. Analytical applications, uh, that's in my red, okay? Mostly done off the data warehouse, and you got a lot of people. 
uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of users on a data warehouse in these enterprises, right? So you have the data lake at the other end of the spectrum, if you will. It's possibly a larger data store. Doesn't mean it's a more important data store, but it's possibly larger. Uh, and you have a smaller user base and you're moving some of your analytical applications over there. So that's what it looks like today. Now, going into the future, I see that, let me fill it out here. Yeah, you're gonna have uh, expansion of both of these, as I mentioned. Bigger data warehouses, bigger data lakes, and more analytical applications, for sure, for sure, in the enterprise. And that means more on the warehouse, that means more on the lake. It's kind of hard to say, you know, who, who wins. You, they both win, and they should work together. As a matter of fact, the concept that I'm proffering a little bit later is the lake house, and that really brings these two together in the most elegant way that we can do that today, and I think it's just great. So do note that I see an expansion of analytic applications everywhere, um, and I think especially you're gonna see an exponential expansion around the data lake. So yeah, we need these. All right, and let's continue with some definitions, and let's make sure we're on the same page here, the data warehouse, uh, here we have the, the geeky fellow here, and I hope, hope you uh, accept that as I do as an endearing term. Uh, he, you have the, the one or the few supporting the many uh, of the data warehouse. Uh, all right, and I'm gonna show them the data lake. Yeah, you don't have as many users. They're a little bit geeky like us. And whoops, uh, things moved a little, a little out of order there, but uh, we have uh, you know at least uh, the same kind of squad of geeky people supporting that data lake. Now, what you did see there, I'll back up real quick, what you did see there was the movement of the data lake over to under my data warehouse profile because over time, we, the geeky people that are building this stuff, the builders are going to have to know more about how that data is going to be used in the data lake than what we do today. I can raise my hand to the ceiling on that one. Uh, trying to catch up with the uh, data scientists in organizations has been a challenge because they're great at what they do and they've devoted uh, you know, a career to that and I haven't. I've been uh, devoting my career to the building side of things, right? So, and many of you have as well. So the data lake, we're gonna have to get to know more just like we did for the data warehouse and we made it really user-friendly and all this. Uh, the science is gonna be moving to the data lake and that's where organizations are going to forge competitive differentiation. We're going to have to be there. Okay, so the data lake does not sit alone, and that's one thing that uh, I am really um, on the soapbox about these days, is that, yeah, you don't just build a data lake and access it just like you did the data warehouse with a, a BI tool that does some UI-friendly things, all right? To really get the full uh, advantage of a data lake, you need a stack, uh, you need a new stack, you need a machine learning stack, and it looks something like this, and this is somewhat of a flow, a flow, a flow of many that there could be for using the data lake and using it in conjunction with the data warehouse. So historical transactional data might be on either uh, of these, um, and you might have split that into categor categorical data and quantitative data, which enters your machine learning platform, which I'm gonna share with you some uh, meat on that in a minute here, all right? So that's where the models are gonna get trained, scored, evaluated, probably retrained, okay, a few times before deployment in conjunction with the data in the data lake where it operates uh, in real time and scoring occurs. And finally, what it's all about is business action occurs. We work backwards from that business action that we want to build out this conceptual model. So the data lake doesn't sit alone. As a matter of fact, uh, this is for all the technical people out there. <laughs> this is really a couple of great stacks for uh, what we're talking about here when I say the data lake doesn't sit alone. Okay, so this is the Azure stack and the AWS stack, and there are many others. Let me just say that right now. Um, uh, when I say data engineering on here, I do mean the data lake. Uh, when I say data analytics on here, I do mean the data warehouse. There are many choices in these categories. Anytime I, I put a, a, a specific 
full name on, on, on here, I have to say this, and I want to say this, because it's true. There are many choices in these categories, but these are the platforms that are really becoming the standard stack for Azure and AWS. They're the ones that we've used, or the ones that we like. Now, I would not get into, oh, let's do a best of breed here, and let's just do the Azure data catalog over here in AWS, not that it would work in the first place, but, you know, mixing and matching across this, uh, not something that I would get into too much. Although that does not mean at all that I would not go with a multi-vendor approach as appropriate. Uh, so going down the line, you might, might have Kubel, Snowflake with Databricks and the Elation catalog and pulling this off the top of my head, uh, the Talon, you know, Talon for Data Movement or Informatica for that. Um, yeah, that's another stack, a stack category, if you will, uh, a true best of breed stack category. Go with that if you like as well. And then there are um, platforms like Cloudera that do it all as well, okay? Um, so, you know, um, there's a lot of choices here, but let's kind of run down what you're going to need to really take maximal advantage of the data lake and get those analytics uh, up and running. Obviously, a data engineering platform, HD Insight or Elastic Map Reduce, and this is the core of the data lake. And then you have the data analytics, Synapse or Redshift. Now, either one of these first two rows might be what you Focus on, focus on to make the determination of the platform that you're going to use. And, the, and then you just fill out the platform with the other things you see on here, okay? So, because a lot of you are, are asking me or are, are fielding the question yourself of, should we go with Azure or should we go with the AWS stack? Well, I'm, I'm trying to give you some pointers to, to uh, unwind that thing and get it moving. And so, stick in the first two columns. I think those are the main things first two rows, excuse me. And uh, the other things are important too, though. Uh, you want to look at all of them. So for your data science, there's Azure Machine Learning, and then there's SageMaker for AWS, Data Catalog, got the Azure Data Catalog, got a Glue Data Catalog in AWS. I do note that neither one of them have great workload management yet, nothing overarching, only individual applications uh, have their own workload management features. So that, that'll fill in over time, but um, and so uh, I'm getting ready for that, and I went ahead and put it on here. Uh, data movement, Azure Data Factory, or you have Glue or a data pipeline. Uh, your overarching deployment, Azure Data Portal, AW Azure Portal and AWS Portal, and for security, Azure Active Directory, or identi identify access management. They're, both of these stacks are pretty good at keeping up with one another <laughs> and uh, making sure that their stacks fill in, as you, as you see, workload management not there for either one. So that'll change and probably will change for both within a span of six months. So we'll see. But there you go. There's a couple stacks and again, there's more, but when you wanna get the most out of the lake, you wanna do all that. So now reference architectures are a funny thing and I, I have two minds about sharing them uh, in a presentation, but I will because you like it, you tell me, and um, it's, it's appropriate. Now. Um, but what I also want to say about reference architectures is don't feel bad if yours doesn't look like this. As a matter of fact, none will look just like this. Okay, this is a nice, clean PowerPoint reference architecture. Your mileage may vary. Your mileage may vary a lot. You might, yours might look like uh, uh, spaghetti or something. Okay, you want to start to unwind that because that's, uh, that's a real problem if that's the case. But anyway, you're just moving forward. We have low latency data that's gonna come in now through a distributed pub subsystem. A lot of people use uh, Kafka for that, or maybe Pulsar or RabbitMQ, something that's going to sort out the topics, sort out the topics and get that into stream processing, which is gonna be needed for that low latency data. That low latency data, that's the net new data to organizations in terms of getting under management. And that's net new in, in, over the past five to 10 years. Um, if you have an older model of this architecture, you don't even have that in there yet. And you really need to get it in there and start capturing your low latency data, wherever it may be. And then there's the batch data, which we're familiar with, applications, files, ELT or ETL, that's what you still have. And that's mostly coming from relational databases and ERPs and stuff like that. All of it's going into the lake, that's the box at the bottom. Um, I'm using S3 as an example, so obviously AWS here. Um, uh, we have learned to prefer the Parquet format for that data. 
because it's a quote unquote columnar and provides advantages to most of the queries that you're going to have ultimately from this. But uh, that's not necessary. And you have your data warehouse. Now, if your lake is the staging area for the warehouse, everything is going to flow from, flow from there either through stream processing or ELT or some form of import. There's now, these days, there's like five, six legitimate ways to do this. And ETL, of course, as well. We should probably have a focused uh, webinar on that topic so we can sort out the, the ways, because that's pretty important as well. Okay. Now, the data warehouse, uh, again, if we're keeping history in the data lake, that's going to offload data to the lake, because the data warehouse is going to, even though I show a nice, clean, one-way street here, uh, it's going to capture some data that, at least for the time being, until you get to this nice reference architecture, it's going to capture some data that uh, is not in the lake, all right? And um, it's going to have to push that data on there. And it may curate some data because of all the analytics that occurs in the data warehouse. Some data may be curated there that you want in your lake. Okay, so I show that flow. And then I have a reach through flow. See the queue? Okay, that's for query. Queries that are that start in the warehouse, and most of them will, that reach on through to the data lake and capture the data there and pull that data in. It's not going to be as fast. It's not going to be as elegant. You're going to have to set it up. You're going to have to bite that bullet and get over that hump. Once you do, it's smooth sailing from there, and then you have created the, the lake house concept, and that is really a strong concept for the enterprise today, that reach through to the data lake. Now, I'm not talking about your data scientists, which are kind of going the other way, and, and frankly, one of the reasons why we quote unquote offload data from the warehouse to the lake sometimes is because the scientists want that data. Yes, they want that data in there as well as all the maybe petabytes of detailed data that's coming in and being stored in S3. So moving on, here's an example architecture. I won't belabor this, but just to show you that forms of the architecture that I just showed you are actually out there in production. Uh, this is from Uber. Um, they have kind of like what I showed you, some low latency data, some batch data. Uh, they have Kafka for their distributed pub sub system. You know, they have a lake, it's on Hadoop, uh, formatted as Parquet. They use Spark ETL to get some of that, actually most of it into Vertica. And uh, Vertica begins, is, is a foundation for a lot of the access that occurs around the machine learning that they're doing today. And of course, for all the other um, more traditional standard types of uh, access via reports, et cetera. So, yes, it's not all just theoretical. All right, using the data lake, here we go. Let's look at using the data lake. Now we're gonna put some governance over the top, but it's not gonna be your full on data governance. It's not gonna be that full canister of everything that you've been doing, hopefully you've been doing, or, or let me put it a different way. The, the, the data governance that you think you know you should be doing on the data warehouse. Okay, it may not be all that, but there, it is something. Um, you just don't just want to uh, lock and load garbage into your data lake, that's gonna be a problem. So yes, we have data stewardship coverage. And uh, now ideally, a uh, little soapbox time here again, ideally the stewardship is by subject area across business data subjects. And that spans all the different vessels that that data is gonna be stored in. And that's okay. Uh, it does expand. My point is it does expand all the way to the data lake for sure. As well, data catalog, you want that to cover the data in the data lake. It's going to be a little bit more work because a lot of data there, but uh, the, we want to establish data catalogs inside of organizations as places that really do facilitate data access as well as uh, data management. You're going to have less transformation on data. Uh, you're going to have uh, your nulls and blanks. You want them to be consistent. You want dates formatted in a certain way. Yes, data will have rangers, patterns, and outliers that you want to at the least identify, uh, if not manage uh, in the integration process. Yes, the data there will have some relationships that you'll want to note. There will be business rules that may have to be applied to that data. There may be data classification for uh, data security purposes, for sure, in that data. And there may also be confidence scores. This is something that I keep talking about, very few people do, but it's 
how confident are we in this data? And different levels of confidence speak to the different ways that the data really can ultimately be used. So are people using the data lake out there? Yes, they are. They certainly are. There are successful implementations right now across many industries and use cases, uh, pretty much you name it. And a lot of these you're going to look at and say, well, I'm doing that today, but I'm doing it in my data works. That's okay. That's okay. But as you move into more maturity, as you move into machine learning, you are going to find that the data lake provides an efficient and economic uh, um, uh, component of the stack for doing this in the best way possible today. And so you are going to ultimately include uh, the data lake in all of this type of analysis, even if the data warehouse is implicated as well. They work together in the lake house concept. All right, so let's talk a little bit about deploying the data lake. Now we're all convinced we need one, right? And uh, we've maybe found some, some things in there that, that we can uh, help out our organizations with uh, by using uh, a data lake approach. And uh, we've kind of ferreted out what it is and how it's gonna work architecturally. Let's deploy one, all right. So in the data lake, so the data lake is, um, it's not Hadoop HDFS, but these are managed deployments in the Hadoop family of products. And probably by next year this time, I won't even be saying that anymore because that would, that would be kind of an older concept. But technically, these are in the Hadoop family of products. All right, external tables in the Hive Metastore. Uh, we're mostly still deploying Hive on these uh, deployments. They point to the cloud storage and your big choices today are S3, Google Cloud Storage, or Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, which we've recently benchmarked, and that is available for you to run SQL against the data, SQL-like kinds of things against the data. And don't forget Hive QL and Spark SQL require entries in the Metastore. Yeah, I'm, I'm going from 10,000 feet to to two feet here, sorry about that. Um, object storage instances and clusters have local storage on the physical drives mounted to the instances themselves, HDFS and Hive. So object storage technologies access their cloud vendors respective cloud storage. I'll stop reading, but that is the data lake concept. The data lake of the future is going to be paired with an analytical engine that charges only by what you use. And I believe on a prior webinar in this series, I talked a little bit about price performance because the pricing of these things, you're going to need to know some things about. If you have a lot of data that can sit in cold storage and only needs to be accessed or analyzed occasionally stored in the cloud storage, this is that data lake concept. Um, what do I wanna say about this? this? This is emblematic of the situation that I mentioned earlier where if you really know down at the technical level what's going on, you can think broader than just classifications of data access will occur at the lake or the or this mart or that warehouse, but you can think, well, what technically is really going to work? And if you really know the, the uh, structure of the workload, you can make a great selection, not just a shallow selection. And this is part of that. If you have a ton of data that can sit in cold storage and only needs to be accessed or analyzed occasionally, if you know that to be true, Put that in your lake. And this is a sample cluster configuration using the Google Big Query, Big Query as the foundation, the analytic data store. So I've talked a little bit about uh, AWS and Azure. I'm going to bring in uh, Google here and show you some things here. These are some of the different versions uh, of the Google stack, at least at some point in the not too distant past uh, anyway. So uh, as you can see, you're going to need a few things to complete the stack uh, in order to do great data science kind of across the board uh, with your data lake. So some tips, if possible, configure remote data to be stored in Parquet format. Um, use GitHub for your code distribution. Um, use data partitioning to improve performance. Co-locate compute and storage in the same region. Encryption and drop commonly used data in the lake, data that would, would commonly be used by the users. I maybe should reword that, but commonly used by the users of the lake, which are again, the, the scientists. And one thing that we've just learned to just do, to just do is to push master data from uh, MDM if we have it in MDM 
push that into the data lake. Yeah, that's a, that's a little different way of thinking. But again, we're trying to support our scientists. And some of them are, I mean, uh, we're kind of getting, getting into it here, but uh, some of them are, you know, they, they, they do work at different levels, right? And they may not want to be switching all the time. They may, I don't, I don't mean to say they're going to do some basic reporting, you know, the P&L reporting for last month being done by our data scientists. No, I'm not saying that. Not that there's anything wrong with P&L reporting, but uh, I'm not saying that. I am saying that the scientists will do some other forms of reporting other than their deep data science experiments. And they, they need some pedestrian data in there as well to do that. Okay, I think I promised somewhere in the lead up to this presentation that I would talk a little bit about uh, the data that goes in there and, and the data that really I'm talking about the data that we're going to store somewhere. We're going to get under management. We're going to get it where we know where it is. We're going to get it where we believe in it. We're going to get it where it has acceptable data quality. We're going to get it where users are using it in, in uh, appropriately user-friendly terms. So to get that data in, you have to look at the superset of data that you have access to, including third-party data. All data is AI data, though. So if you're truly uh, uh, concerned, if you're truly committed as well to artificial intelligence, you will start to think this way. You'll start to think about storing all the data, all your call center recordings and chat logs all streaming sensor data, all customer account data, email response metrics, and so on, video data, website behavior data. And that's a great place to start, by the way. Some people ask, well, where do I start on this journey? Well, you have a website, right? And you want people to use it, uh, even if even if you're B2B, you, you want it to be great. Uh, start, start collecting that click stream. Start also looking for things that you can improve upon that are being done maybe the quote unquote hard way today. Uh, look for things that can be automated through artificial intelligence. And that usually backs you into the need for the data lake. Sentiment analysis, user generated content, social graph data, and other external data sources. Yes, yeah, third party data. Third party data does get stored in data lakes. Absolutely. It's voluminous and it's appropriate. You see, Artificial intelligence and machine learning are on the horizon, if not here today, looking us straight in the face. Looming on the horizon is, horizon is an injection of AI ML into every piece of software that we buy. And I'm going through a study right now of all the uh, great data integration methods uh, of today out there in the organization. And they're not all just ETL tools either, by the way. There's a, a quite a variety of choices that you have and artificial intelligence is one thing I, that we're looking for because we think that's a, that's a showstopper, that's a keeper, uh, whether it has artificial intelligence or not today, today. Today, the software should have strong AI, maybe not full AI, the strong AI, start to, start to be a little bit smarter. Okay, so much for software, but consider the domain of data integration, predicting with high accuracy, the steps ahead, fixing its own bugs, you know, in the pipelines. Machine learning is being built into databases, so the data will be analyzed as it's loaded, as it's loaded. Not after it's been loaded into a database and somebody comes along and does some great analysis after the fact, maybe weeks after the fact, but as it's being loaded into the database. Think about that. And uh, think about the split of the necessary AI and ML between the edge of corporate users and the software itself. That's still being worked out. And you need to think about that as you architect your data environment out there in the enterprise. Now, you're also gonna need uh, to separate data into training data and non-training data, real data. Training data for machine learning and artificial intelligence, you have to have enough data for that to build the model and your data will determine the depth of AI that you can achieve. And this is all tricky stuff, which we can go into in more detail, but for example, statistical modeling, machine learning, or deep learning, and the accuracy. So the level of data will determine that. So we have uh, established importance of the data lake, how to architect one into the environment, some specifics about 
building out a data lake and some of the workloads that might go on it and how it works together with the data warehouse and other components in the environment. And this brings me to the end of the formal part of the presentation. Hopefully you've been lobbing your questions in there to Shannon. Uh, if not, uh, maybe do so real quick right now. And I will entertain your questions now. Over to you, Shannon. William, thank you so much as always for a great presentation. Um, and just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email for this webinar by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. So, uh, William, can you be more specific about a uh, lighter data governance in data lakes? Yeah, I mean, um, I tried to be, uh, but but uh, um, you, this is when you have the user community that you have on the data lake, as opposed to the user community that you have on a data warehouse, you don't need the same level of data governance. And by that, I mean, maybe you don't need the same level of data catalog, uh, data catalog uh, depth. You don't need the same level of business data definitions. You don't need the same level of, uh, you do need security, but you don't necessarily need the, the same level of, um, I would say, fine-tuned security where you have, say, 10 different profiles. You may have one, you may have one or two, and that's part of data governance. And so, um, so the, way, the way I see it is, uh, I think most organizations need more than what they have, but I think they, they're hesitant to get started because they see what's going on over there in the data warehouse. And in many organizations, Data governance isn't, uh, shall we say, shall we say, the most, uh, say, user-friendly of uh, functions in the organization. It should be. It should be facilitating great data access. It should be creating assets that users really enjoy and get a lot of value out of. But if they're not, and who wants that in, in, the, in this new structure that we're building called the data lake? Um, so that's something to get over because some is definitely appropriate and some data quality, data quality is job one for data governance, right? And some data quality is gonna be appropriate. So here you have data governance now in the organization creating a deep set of rules, a deep set of business rules that need to be applied to data uh, as it goes into the data warehouse. But you know what I, and, and that's not all applicable to the data lake, but you know what I really like about where data governance is going is the ability with these governance tools and the catalogs to, set your business rules, and then they just, they automatically find their way into the pipelines that you build, into the data that you load, so that all the data actually adheres to governance standards. So this is all going to get easier. This is all what I'm talking about here. It's going to get easier. Um, and the, the, this whole notion of, well, you know, you have more governance here, less data governance there. Eventually that'll go away because you'll just have governance over the top. And that's what we're, that's what we're getting to. But in the actionable future, we need some light data governance uh, over our data lakes. And William, uh, why write to S3 with limited quote unquote schema when it can go to data warehouse with full schema and just be, and be just as accessible to machine learning, AI stats, analytics? Well, that's a great question. Um, and when you say just as accessible, I'm, it depends on the volume of data that we're talking about uh, to, to whether that's just as accessible or not. Yes, it would probably be more accessible if you could store it in, in relational databases, um, but that's not necessarily the most cost-effective thing. And it's not accessible if it's not, if it's not stored, if it's not managed. And that, unfortunately, may be the case in many organizations, because they're dealing with tons of data. I want to say, you know, tens of terabytes, hundreds of terabytes, potentially petabytes of data that um, they're trying to bring into their machine learning alg algorithms to get them really, really fine-tuned. And that's just not going to make, make a lot of sense today uh, in the uh, data warehouse where you have, yes, of course, it's a lower level of function that you have in the lake. And yes, of course, it's a lower level of different things like performance, but you actually have the data stored, you're actually bringing the data into the, into the algorithms, um, and it's, it's just a great symbiotic, symbiotic thing. So um, horses for courses here, you're gonna have some data that makes sense 
in both of them. And also maybe another aspect of this question is, you know, why should you bring it through the through the lake? Why should you bring it through a staging area? You know, so I said the lake is a staging area. So why should you bring it through a staging area? Well, why are we staging data in the first place? We're staging a lot of data because it's not yet quite appropriate for uh, its final formatting, and we're going to have to do some transformation to it. And so we can do that in the lake. We can do that somewhere else. A lot of people have used uh, ETL tools for this, obviously, in the past. And um, one of the first first big uses, I would say, of cloud storage was to take cycles off of that and uh, and just get it in get it in an ELT place in the in cloud storage where that staging activity could be done. So I'd say the answer to the question is really because we want to stage the data and because it's appropriate for really large size data that is appropriate for machine learning. And we, what is Hive Metastore, and is it the only way to use a data lake? Um, no, it's, no, it's not the only way. It's just um, maybe it's something that's kind of stuck uh, in my head and stuck in our in our fingertips as we uh, create these things for our clients and for our benchmarks. But um, we just found that it facilitates uh, the Hive style of queries. Uh, should we want to do any of that? And so um, we just automatically do it. And I think Hive is still an important part of the stack. And um, this, this, I'm, maybe it's a bit of a throwback. Maybe you're not going to do it, but I think there there are there have been a few edge times, and I can't really place it right now, but there have been a few edge times when even with a robust set of other tools, we've fallen back on Hive to do a thing or two. And so I just kind of want that in there. So um, the Hive Meta Store has, has always worked out great for us, and so I say just load it. So what about the cost and resources to connect and integrate various technologies to the data lake? Is that, this seems to be usually very high. Uh, that was the cost of the resources that get connected to the data lake. So kind of all these other things that um, I suggested here might need to get connected to a data lake. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, that's why it's a stack. That's why I made a, a big point of it, um, that uh, the lake doesn't sit by itself. It's a stack and I, I, can, I can share with you some recent research that I've been doing on these stacks and more that that best of breed stack carries with it that I talked about earlier. You know, I said, you know, Kubel, Snowflake, Databricks, et cetera, you know, piece it all together that carries with it a large amount of overhead in terms of not only the technical effort to connecting all the pieces, but also, you know, the work effort, the people effort. And the people effort is still very significant with data lakes, by the way. I didn't kind of bring that out in this presentation, but it is, and you want to minimize it. And so that's why a lot of people are thinking about these as stacks. And um, in some research that will be out, um, I'd say probably in the next week or two, um, I would say keep an eye on my social and stuff and uh, look for that research and it will it will go into that question in a lot of detail and share with you the costs of the stacks. And William, uh, what could be the link or the relation between data virtualization and data lake? Yeah, okay. I'm glad that question came up because I didn't mention it, but but man, is it is it ever still something that needs to be in our architectures? And I usually say it, so um, slapping my my forehead for that. But um, yeah, data virtualization should be a part of this as well, because going back 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 to the uh, first ten minutes of this presentation, I was talking about you know the data warehouse and the data marts and the thises and the thats that you're going to have out there, and you're not going to have all the data in one perfect place. Um, for any individual query. So data virtualization is my catch-all. It's kind of like, you know, I've mentioned the Hive Metastore, we just do it. Yeah, I just want to just do it uh, in, in, in architectures that are serious, you know, because you're going to have those edge cases. And most of the time we build our, we build our architectures for the 80%, and we just kind of hope the 20% never works out or never happens, but uh, it does happen. Then it sucks down, you know, 80% of our time at that point, right? If we can put a little more foresight into it, we can change that equation. And, 
data virtualization is a big part of that. So I, I'm not here to say, yeah, all the queries that go into the data lake have to go through, through a data virtualization layer. I'm not one of those virtualization people. Um, but I think that having virtualization capabilities across the lake and the warehouse, you know, helps with the lake house concept. Um, but it's not, I mean, the lake house concept is the data warehouse is actually doing it. But you have to set that up and there's always a time lag and so on. You don't want to get dependent on something that doesn't make sense for the long haul. Like if, if, if you know, you don't want to just do everything the virtualization way. Maybe I'm expanding the question way too much here, but you, you don't want to start doing things that um, that you know are going to get a lot of traction and snowball down that hill, and you're just going to be stuck kind of doing that for the long haul, and you know it's not right. So put a fork in that at the very beginning and get data virtualization going in these environments for sure. I think we have a time for a question or two more. Uh, in the data governance section, you have mentioned outliers and patterns along with data with range or data range. I can understand, but not the patterns and outlander. A uh, data range I can understand, but not the patterns and outliers. Could you elaborate? Well, uh, we have expectations of data that it fits. Uh, I'll start with data ranges because the person gets that. Yeah, it fits within a range, right? Um, if you have somebody's age, it's going to be between zero and um, what's the oldest person in the world, like 130. So let's say 140. It's going to be in that range, and that's what we expect. We see something outside that range uh, that would be clearly a problem somewhere. Um, it's the same with these other things, patterns, the patterns to data. If we see certain, certain like, um, um, I don't know, electricity usage or something being in a certain range for my house versus the uh, a commercial building down the street, which is at a different level. You don't want to apply the same rules to me as you do to that building. You, you want to have appropriate rules, uh, have appropriate patterns established for me versus that building. And so um, patterns means multiple, multiple patterns uh, across the data that's selectively applied, depending upon other components of the profile of the person or whatever the whatever the thing is that, that you're modeling there. And outliers, same thing, you know, uh, having, uh, you know, a, a month of keep on, keeping on the electricity example to have, you know, I'm going along at, I don't know what the good numbers are, but 10 gigahertz or whatever of it. And, you know, suddenly it spikes to a thousand. That's a, that's an outlier, that's a problem. And sometimes these things are, these things are, are captured in analytics. And you know what, that's okay too. If, if somebody's gonna sit there at the end of the, load cycle and run some queries against the data and say, okay, oh, well, are there any outliers in this data? Are there any patterns in this data that set the problem and so on? Anything I should be aware of? Any patterns that are happening in the data that are good patterns like, wow, sales keep trending up in this region. So uh, let's, let's find out why and apply it everywhere. You know, you can do that in, in analytics after the fact, but you can also do it um, the data governance way, which data governance to me, it stops when it doesn't stop, but it, it, in terms of its life cycle, it, it really gets strongly applied to the data before it gets made ready for the users. And, and so it's, it's in the data. It's in the data that gets released to the users. I won't say that once it's loaded, it's, it's ready for action. Once data is loaded in the data lake or the warehouse or what have you, it's not necessarily ready for action. You still might have some things to do to that data. You still might have some, some transformation to apply to that data. Okay, great. But where does it come from? What, what, what rule base does it come from? And I say that comes from data governance, and that applies to the data before it gets released to the user community. So patterns and outliers, that's just part of that. Well, I am. Thank you so much. That does bring us to the top of the hour. Thanks, everybody, for attending and being so engaged in everything we do. We just love it. Just again, a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this web presentation with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, everybody, so much. Stay safe out there. Thanks, William. Thank you. Bye-bye.